Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today, I have a very special guest back on, Greg Potter. This is, I think, probably the fourth time now we had him on a couple months ago. Always an interesting conversation with Greg. So Greg, thank you for coming back on and yeah, looking forward to our chat today. Pleasure. Yeah, good to chat, mate. Yeah. So I guess before we dive into it, it hasn't been too long since we chatted. Is there anything that's gone on in the last like month or two in your end that, you know, interest to the, the to the audience? Not really anything that I can speak about just yet. Well, I think it would be of interest. So I'll awesome. keep my sealed for now. I love it. Making us wait for it. So next time we have you on, we'll, we'll be able to hopefully uh, chat about that. But no, that's great. So what I wanted to chat with you about today was just supplements, like health supplements, you know, muscle building supplements, whatever it may be, and just kind of what the research says on them. And also what I would like to chat about too, to, to kind of start off this conversation is what are some mistakes people make with supplements and what would be some things that you would just, you know, kind of tell people, Hey, you want to look out for this, you know, when looking to supplement with? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's one that just isn't discussed enough because people tend to be relatively simplistic when discussing supplements. And I just try and consider many different factors without unnecessarily overcomplicating things. So just to mention a few of these, one of them would be the fact that you might take a supplement for one thing, but supplements tend to influence many different outcomes. And so if we think about supplements for sleep, just as an example, then maybe you're struggling with stress-related sleep issues. And you also struggle with anxiety. You have a bit of a low mood. That would benefit from a different supplement if you struggled with stress-related sleep issues, but you also had some other goals and you didn't have that low mood. So let's say that you were keen to lose fat, just as one example. Another consideration is how these supplements interact with each other. And frankly, we really don't know that much about that particular subject because they typically get either studied in isolation or in rare instances, you will have a supplement company that has lots of funding and they can go to a research group and say, will you study our supplement? And in that case, the product might contain 16 ingredients and it's hard to identify exactly what the source of the outcome is. It could be ingredient A, it could be ingredient B, there could be some sort of additive effect between the two, it could be the ingredients A and C are cancelling each other out, and so on. I think another is the source of the supplement. And fortunately, I think the supplement industry is better regulated now than it once was. But certainly purity used to be a big issue. And a lot of the research will use standardized extracts of plants, as an example, or it will use protein powders that have known amino acid profiles. Maybe these products in the research process will be tested for the presence of contaminants. When you're trying to recapitulate the effects that were found in a particular study on a particular supplement, you want to try and use the same product that was used. And for that reason, I think using standardized extracts and ideally products that have been tested by a third party for the presence of contaminants and to check that they contain the concentrations of active ingredients that they claim they do is really important. And I think that's most relevant to things like plant extracts, but it can also be relevant to things like fish oil, protein powder, and so on. And famously, there have been a few instances of supplements containing various different banned substances. Years ago, I think that happened quite frequently. There were many different products that were tainted with things like androgenic anabolic steroids and various stimulants too. I think that happens less and less now. But fortunately, there are websites such as Consumer Lab where people can go, they can subscribe, and they can find various different supplements there where this company has gone, it's pulled a bunch of products off the shelves, and it's tested those individual products for the active ingredients and then also for common contaminants. So just as an example of this, let's say you were interested in taking curcumin for joint health. Turmeric is quite often contaminated with lead and curcumin tends to be extracted from turmeric. And so there's a chance that some of those products would contain substantial amounts of lead, which is a heavy metal that's quite toxic and incredibly hard for your body to eliminate. And so it makes sense to test those products for the presence of lead. Or if you're using a cocoa product, then it makes sense to test for the presence of cadmium, which is a heavy metal that's common in the soil, particularly in Latin American countries. Then, of course, there are products that are available 
available that contain so-called proprietary blends. And really, that's a way of supplement companies masking what's in the product because they use vanishingly small doses of the active ingredients that aren't congruent with it's in the order of the proportions of the ingredients in the product. The first ingredient that you see comprises the largest share and there'll be another ingredient that's inexpensive, then that ingredient might be included in a dose that's either efficacious or produces some sort of sensation. So commonly you might see things like niacin because it creates a kind of tingling sensation in the skin and that makes people think, oh, this must be doing something. And so I think avoiding proprietary blends is, is also a good way to go. And I realize that what I've just said is in some ways practical, but not always practical. I think Fortunately, now there's a lot more as opposed to some products that might have been widely used previously, but that we now know to not do what they were hoped to do. So I'll pause there, but hopefully that's some helpful background information. Yeah, the, the proprietary, pro, pro, well, I cannot say it. I was hoping you would hit on because that is important, right? Like you said, they'll they'll typically put that in there and then it's like, you don't really know how of each one. And like you said, that's a way for them, you know, put the, the cheaper ingredient without, you know, and so definitely looking out for that. You also said that the testing aspect of it, it but it sounds like that, is much better now and it's a lot more regulated than, than what it used to be. So, I mean, I'm assuming that probably still is a potential concern, but it sounds like that's a lot better. Is there anything specific that maybe somebody should look at there on that? Melatonin supplements not that long ago, just took lots of melatonin products off the shelves, tested them for the concentrations of melatonin in them, how they married up to what was claimed on the label, and then the presence of some other metabolites too. And they basically found the concentration varied from roughly... 80% less than what was on the label to roughly 470% more than what was on the label. And some of the products also contain serotonin, which is along the same synthetic pathway. When you look at melatonin synthesis, serotonin is one of its precursors. And ultimately the rate limiting enzyme in that particular pathway is Aryl alchemine and acetyl transferase. I think I should recall that from my PhD because one of the chapters was about melatonin specifically. So anyway, still happens. In terms of being a smart consumer, there are companies that many supplement and food product producers will go to and they will send their products in batches to these companies to have them tested. And then these companies will give them stamp approval. In the UK, those include Informed Sport, which is widely used by sports nutrition companies in particular. And they also have another brand under the same umbrella. And I think that at least one of those is also used in the US. So you might want to look to see if there's a body such as Informed Sport wherever you live. And then when possible, choose manufacturers that have third party certification. When you look, for instance, at Consumer Lab, and there are limitations with something like Consumer Lab. If you're just taking a single product off the shelves, it's not like that product is necessarily representative of everything that this manufacturer produces. But when you do look at Consumer Lab and you look across some of the different products that they've tested so far, there are clearly certain companies that consistently make products that contain what they and so were i to just go to amazon and i was interested in let's say source i have strong faith that life extension products are going to contain what they claim they do because they consistently check out when they're tested by third parties such informed sport and i personally tend to gravitate to certain brands i have no affiliation with any of those brands but i think brands such as thorn and life extension you might pay a bit of a premium for them i think for the most part that's worth it and as we'll probably get to fortunately many of the better supplements out there just aren't that expensive and they might be the products that are generating lots of hype and noise but they're ones that you can depend on for good results that's good to know because i think that is important for people to be able to see hey you know can i trust what, what's actually in here so a couple other things on this obviously I, I guess probably one thing to look out for too and we'll probably talk about the dosages of it and everything like that but that's probably one thing too that you'll want to pay attention to as well too right because like they're just going to put it in for example like first one that comes to mind is like vitamin d right so it's like important to pay attention to the dosage is of what's in there as well too because that will that will play a large role um, in it as well too and they're all going to be yeah. dosed differently some other variables that are worth considering and i didn't want to rattle off all of them because there are lots yeah, of them right they would include things such as time of day at which you take them that's not relevant to a lot of products again one of the issues here is just that the huge majority of supplements haven't been tested for whether there is an 
ideal time of day at which to take them. And in my mind, the best way of looking at that would be to look at timing of intake relative to somebody's biological clock, their circadian phase, just because your 8pm, Jeff, isn't necessarily my 8pm. Right. If I naturally fall asleep at 10pm and you naturally fall asleep at midnight, then 8pm is at a later circadian phase for me than it is for you. We do know that this is relevant to some supplements. So let's say that you're using caffeine as a pre-workout product and you train in the afternoon and you train at 5pm, you normally go to bed at 9pm. You wouldn't necessarily necessarily want to take six milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight at 4 p.m. Because there's a good chance that unless you have extraordinary liver function and <laughs> genetics that encode certain receptors and enzymes that degrade certain drugs, that is going to interfere with your sleep. So time of day is definitely one of them. Another is some products have known interactions with other food constituents. So just as an example of this, we know that carbohydrate can increase muscle creatine uptake. And so it makes sense to consume that with some carbohydrate if you're trying to maximize your uptake of it. I think over time that probably washes out, but there are clearly some products that are best taken with food. Perhaps a better example would be something like taking a fat soluble vitamin. If you're going to take vitamin D, it would be best to not take that on an empty stomach, but maybe to take that with say your first meal that contains some fat. We also know that something like dietary fiber might interfere with the uptake of certain supplements. And I think this is probably very relevant to things such as minerals. Sometimes there are known interactions between minerals where we know that one mineral will block the uptake of another. There's some sort of antagonistic relationship between the two. Some of this is also relevant to nutraceutical by which I really mean supplements, but think of something like quercetin, drug interactions. And quercetin wasn't the best example necessarily. That was just the first thing that came to mind. But the point is that there are some known interactions between certain nutraceuticals and certain drugs. So for example, there are some polyphenols in grapefruit that dramatically affect the metabolism of certain drugs. Specifically, there's one called naringenin. And so you wouldn't necessarily want to take that alongside some medications because the blood levels of the medications that you would reach having consumed the grapefruit or the naringenin would be substantially higher than they otherwise would be. And so actually the optimal dose in that circumstance might differ from what the research would otherwise indicate. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I figured, you know, the dosage of, and then like you said, even, even the timing of it too could, could also potentially play a role, especially like you said, caffeine. I think that's a great example of that. Although I feel like people probably don't think of caffeine as, is necessarily a supplement, but, but it is right. So, and, and like you said, that could affect sleep. And so that is important to pay attention to the dosage and then also the, the timing of it, which we'll probably talk about that, some of these supplements. Last thing real quick, on the hierarchy of like, hey, you know, obviously the supplements are going to be dependent on many different things, but where would you place supplements in terms of like its overall importance? Some bodies, again, if they're looking body comp, muscle building, things like that. I have mixed feelings about this because you often hear people say they should be an afterthought. You should attend to everything else first, get your training right, get your nutrition right, sleep well, and attend to all those other lifestyle factors before worrying about supplements. And I understand that perspective. But at the same time, when you look at research that's been done on dietary supplements, it doesn't ask people to make other changes to their lifestyle for the most part. Yeah. And yet it does show benefits for certain supplements. So from my perspective, why would you not consider using supplements from the start if there's clearly a strong indication to use this supplement for this person? Because it can be a really easy win. So let's say that you've got somebody who is having a hard time building muscle and yes, they absolutely should try try and optimize their training, their nutrition and so on. But why wouldn't they just start taking creatine monohydrate too? It doesn't make any sense. So I think you, you've got to consider everything that's at play and you have to consider somebody's budget and so on. But if there is a supplement that you know is likely to be effective in a particular context, the person can afford it. There are no contraindications to using it. The person is happy to take it. Easy to implement. Just do it. Why? Why would you not? Yeah. No, I like that. That's that's definitely like you said. That's a different approach than what a lot of people would say. Like you know, it's typically oh, you know, they're not. Don't do it. You focus on everything else first. And it's like I mean, if there's like you said, certain reasons to take it, and, and that person needs it, why would you? Why would you not have that easy win with it? So so that makes a lot of sense. And I, I I agree with you on that. I think my mindset on or my thoughts on supplements have changed to more so that of you. Let's dive into uh, some supplements then. So. 
I guess the first one that I have on my list here that I'm interested in is fish oil. Um, so maybe we can talk about why you would take it, you know, um, who would be more likely to need it, and then potentially, you know, some some downsides of fish oil. This, this actually ties in really nicely to what I had on my mind when you were just speaking then before, before you asked the question, because one of the things that I didn't mention is that there are supplements that people consume for their contents, but you can get those contents from foods. And in many instances, it's probably actually preferable to get them from foods. And fish oil, sure enough, is a perfect case in point in my mind. If you look at the associations between, say, fish intake, consuming oily fish such as sardines, mackerel, salmon, and brain health, the associations are stronger than between taking fish oil supplements and brain health. And that's probably in part because some of the fish oil supplements people will consume might be stale because they're full of these highly unsaturated, poly un polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA, that are very prone to oxidation and hence quickly become rancid. Whereas if you're consuming fresh fish, that's less of an issue. But just think about the fact that if you don't consume fish and you're depending on that supplement and it's been sat in your supplement cabinet for the previous year, especially if it hasn't been refrigerated, there's a good chance that that has now gone rancid. And you could probably get some sense as to whether that's the case by cracking open a capsule and smelling it. It shouldn't smell really fishy and have an off smell. And that is quite often the case. So fish oil is an instance where I would really rather people just consume fish. And some people are concerned about things like the presence of heavy metals such as mercury in fish. Mercury tends to bioaccumulate up the food chain, so you get high concentrations of mercury in fish such as swordfish and tuna and shark than you do in fish such as sardines and mackerel. So in general, I'd say favor smaller fish if you're concerned about that. But fish contains other things that will somewhat counteract the presence of any mercury. So for example, many fish are very rich in selenium, which will have that effect. So when possible, I would just say eat oily fish and have it a couple of times a week. I feel fortunate. I love fish. So it's a non-issue and I've never personally supplemented fish oil because I probably consume oily fish four or five times a week in substantial quantities. But if you don't like fish for whatever reason, you could take an EPA, DHA supplement. You don't need to worry about a fancy form such as phospholipid form or anything like that. And if if you do take it, then you might want to take a product that contains a fat-soluble antioxidant too. So quite often you'll find them that contain vitamin E, for instance. You'll want to keep it refrigerated, so store it in a cool, dark place. And again, ideally, you'd want to get it from a manufacturer, checks out when assessed by third parties. In terms of some of the reasons why you might want to take fish oil, there's quite convincing research showing that it's good for cardiovascular health, for brain health, which of course relates to cardiovascular function, or certain types of pain, possibly for musculoskeletal function too, especially in the elderly and for many aspects of metabolic health too. So if you don't like fish, then I, I would consider supplementing it. I don't think that you need to overthink it. And then finally, if you are a vegan, then I do think you'll likely benefit from consuming an algal source of those highly unsaturated fatty acids. And I'm not very familiar with the best vegan products that are out there, but if you shop around that, I'm sure sure that you can find a good algal source. So so a couple of things to follow up on that. So you mentioned, obviously, this would be one that you would push people to consume the, the food. Did you say about two times a week is, is a good oily fish? That's That would be enough to, to make up for not supplementing with it? I, th I think so. Yeah. If somebody has a history of consuming very little fish and they haven't su supplemented fish oil along the way, then maybe they might want to initially consume it slightly more frequently. It's worth mentioning that there is some competition for uptake of different different types of fatty acids. So specifically the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio has received some attention. If you consume lots of omega-6 fatty acids, so linoleic acid, alongside those omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, then you could crowd out some of the effects of the omega-3 fats that you're looking for. But I think that the relevance of that might be tissue specific and it's really majoring in the minors for a lot of people and they just frankly don't need to be concerned about it. It's also worth mentioning that the fats that you consume accumulate in your body. And so if you took a, an adipose tissue biopsy of yourself, the composition of your fat mass would in part reflect your recent dietary fat intake. And so that's why you, you want to load your fat cells with things like oleic acid from extra virgin olive oil, EPA, DHA. I think consuming linoleic acid is fine. I think a lot of people historically have said that you need to be very careful about not consuming too much linoleic acid when you look at 
at say pre-industrial people with excellent cardiometabolic health for the most part they don't consume that much of it but i just think it's something that comes along for the ride and when you look at cross-sectional data it doesn't really seem to be bad for people it doesn't negatively associate with many health outcomes and so if you just get some because you consume say some seeds and you consume fatty meat now and then don't worry about it but at the same time i don't think that you should be consuming loads of say corn oil or soy bean oil as your main cooking oils or sunflower oil and instead i push people towards using extra virgin olive oil when possible and then just focusing on making sure that they consume enough of certain fatty foods each day so those would include oily fish and then just tangentially because i realized that not speaking about supplementation specifically now i also think that there's convincing evidence that consuming plenty of things like tree nuts walnuts in particular is really good for cardiometabolic health and brain health also real quick before we go on to the next one epa dha is there a certain amount that you would want somebody to get in a fish oil supplement or are you not overly concerned about that i'm not hugely concerned about it to be honest i think if anything dha might be relatively more important i also think that the relative importance of each of these fatty acids is likely to depend in part on someone's genetics yeah. there's been some interesting nutrigenetics work looking at people from different parts of the world and their ability to desaturate certain fatty acids and basically you find that people from certain equatorial regions such as say india are better able to desaturate plant-based omega-3 fatty acids than people further from the equator so if you and i jeff are from say relatively northern latitudes quite far from the equator it might be that we're not that able to take some of those plant-based omega-3s and turn them into epa and dha or those longer chain omega-3 fatty acids whereas someone whose heritage is firmly based in india might be better able to do so and so for them they probably need to be less concerned about consuming enough oily fish and actually if they consume lots of things like flax seeds and walnuts they might be able to to have bodily level of those long chain fatty acids that are absolutely fine interesting awesome cool well, let's go on to the next one vitamin d yeah so certainly garnered a lot of attention in the last three years in particular especially in the wake of the covid pandemic because it does seem that supplementing with vitamin d and vitamin d states in general does somewhat influence somebody's risk of getting severe covid but as I'm sure most listeners know, vitamin D is very important for everything from immune function to bone health and bone mineralization, basically making sure that calcium that you consume ends up in the right place. Vitamin K has some roles in that too. And it also seems to be important for musculoskeletal function. There's a little bit of research suggesting that if you take people who have suboptimal vitamin D status and you give them vitamin D as a supplement, then you might slightly improve certain musculoskeletal function outcomes outcomes. And frankly, I would rather people improve their vitamin D status for the most part from spending more time outside. Our bodies synthesize vitamin D in response to UVB radiation. And the reason why I would prefer that is that exposure to sunlight has all sorts of positive effects on health, obviously provided that you don't get burned. And ironically, what can happen is that people in countries where there's lots of sun year round have low vitamin D status because it's just too hot. And so you'd think that they would be absolutely loaded with vitamin D and they're just not. So sometimes it's worth doing a little bit of testing and, and try and work out whether that might be the case. But I think for the most part, just trying to get adequate sun exposure is going to boost your vitamin D status, but it's also going to acutely reduce your blood pressure, increase your levels of certain sex steroids, potentially lift your mood, sharpen your cognition, anchor your circadian rhythms, possibly improve your sleep. If you are at quite a high latitude, then you will likely not be able to synthesize much if any vitamin d at certain times of the year and so that poses the question well during those months of the year when i can't synthesize substantial amounts or any vitamin d should i be supplementing vitamin d and worth mentioning that your body stores vitamin d it being fat soluble it will be stored in your fat tissue and so as you turn over your fat tissue during say the winter months you will be releasing stored vitamin d into your blood that can then be used in various different tissues for all of its roles that are likely to benefit you. And so I think having some sort of circannual or seasonal change in your vitamin D state is, is probably okay. And again, when you think about pre-industrial people who have good health, that's probably always been the case for them. You do get some vitamin D from your diet too, from things like mushrooms, but not that much. And the form of vitamin D that you want, vitamin D3, you might not get that much of either. And I think based on that, it can be prudent for people to take some 
during those dark months of winter if they live far from the equator. So let's just say that you lived in a polar region. I think in that instance, I probably personally would take vitamin D. I'd probably take one, 2,000 international units per day for maybe three or four months of the year. And then during the summer, I'd spend plenty of time outside to keep my stores topped up. But if you live around the equator, I wouldn't necessarily supplement it unless I was one of those people who was terrified of the sun or was just cooked as soon as they stepped outside. And so I therefore actively avoided the sun. So I don't think there's much to lose. There is tiny potential for vitamin D toxicity. It's exceedingly rare. You tend to see it with people such as lifeguards who spend loads of time out in the sun and then they supplement large quantities of vitamin D on top of that too. I don't think that's very smart. But I think being pragmatic, a lot of the listeners might want to take one to 2,000 international units per day for about three months over the winter months if they don't get that much sunlight that time of year. That's good to hear. Yeah, because that's that's typically how I'll supplement with vitamin D is I'll, I'll do it a little bit more in the winter and then during the summer when I know I'm getting outside and I usually cut back. But I guess also too, it would be important to get your levels checked if you can as well too from like blood work because that will obviously tell you a lot. But just to be on the safe side, you know, maybe a little bit more in the winter if you're not getting outside and then you can cut back during the summer. But I would imagine too that getting your blood work done and seeing where that's at is going to be you know important um, as well too. Because I guess do some people naturally just have a little bit more vitamin D or what, is, what does that usually look like? Yeah, that, that's a that's an important question actually. And so one of the interactions that you should bear in mind is how much melanin you have in your skin. And let's say that you are of African ancestry and you now live in Boston, just as an example, where during the winter, you're not getting enough UVB radiation to synthesize any vitamin D. And also because you have so much melanin in your skin, you require a higher dose of UVB radiation to synthesize vitamin D in the first place. In that case, people who have dark skin, who now live quite far from the equator, probably need to be extra particular about getting their levels checked and possibly supplementing with vitamin D. And they might say we want to favor a slightly higher dose. So let's say it's 2000 IU per day instead of 1000. Is it important if you do take you know vitamin D to also take vitamin K too, I believe? I think that's one that I've heard in terms of like, hey, if you take a good amount of vitamin D, you might want to take K2 with that as well too. You can. Yeah. A lot of people don't get much K2, which is menaquinone. And you can supplement that if you like. Just basically make sure that you shuttle calcium into the right depots, namely bones opposed to your blood vessels because you don't want calcified arteries. So you can do that if you like. Otherwise, vitamin K rich foods include things like certain types of cheese and I think certain other animals products too. So maybe if say you're on a vegan diet, you might want to consider supplementing with vitamin K2 as well. I don't think that it's something that most people need to worry about, but if you are being particularly neurotic or if there's some reason to be concerned that your vitamin K status might be suboptimal, then certainly you can do. And when people supplement with vitamin K, they tend to take doses that are substantially higher than say the, the RDA or the RNI or one of these reference nutrient intakes. All right. So next one is magnesium. Yeah. Really, really popular supplement to take. I think a lot of people take it because they think that it's going to help them sleep. And frankly, the research on that, to my eye, isn't particularly compelling. There has been a systematic review suggesting that magnesium supplementation might slightly help with, say, sleep latency, so the time that it takes you to, to fall asleep. But frankly, the data aren't particularly convincing that magnesium supplementation meaningfully improves sleep. Interestingly, also, there's been a phenomenon in recent times in which lots of influencers and science influencers and physicians physician influences speak a lot about specific forms of magnesium and the positive effects of those forms on sleep. And there's just literally no research on them. So you often hear with respect to magnesium threonate, for instance, which is thought to better enter the brain than some other forms of magnesium. Although there are some forms of magnesium, thinking of one called ATA magnesium, that have also been shown in preclinical research to perhaps better enter the brain than certain other varieties, but I digress. So if you're interested in taking magnesium for sleep, then unless you are clinically short on magnesium, Magnesium. I don't think there are strong reasons to think that supplementing magnesium is going to dramatically affect your sleep. You might get some placebo effects though if you have that expectation, which is great. So why would you supplement magnesium? It's the second most common micronutrient insufficiency in the US, I believe. So I think something like 68% of people in your neck of the woods don't get enough. The most common is vitamin D, sure enough. And it's really important for many different reactions in your body. So I think over 300 different enzymes. But 
last count. And low levels of magnesium strongly associate with various different unfortunate health outcomes, everything from depression to the metabolic syndrome. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you should supplement with magnesium. However, when you look at supplementation studies, and there have been various different systematic reviews of meta-analyses of this subject, you do find that magnesium meaningfully improves many different health outcomes in most people. And I think the most striking data, at least to me, are showing cardiometabolic health benefits in conditions such as diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. So magnesium supplementation can reduce fasting blood sugar, it can increase HDL, it can reduce LDL, it can reduce blood pressure. It has so many different positive effects on health. And the nice thing about magnesium is that your gut uptake of magnesium is somewhat influenced by your magnesium status. So if you take too much, you just excrete it out. You don't really have to worry much about that. As an aside, certain forms of magnesium such as magnesium oxide are also quite effective laxatives. So let's just say that <laughs> you, you were blocked up and you were also concerned your magnesium status might be suboptimal. You could take quite a big dose of magnesium and potentially boost your status and also help with your other issue that you're facing at the moment. In terms of forms and doses of magnesium, most of the researchers use magnesium citrate. Citrate is just citric acid. You get that in various different citrus fruits and it's got okay bioavailability. I think something like 30% of it is probably probably taken up, which is comparable to many forms of magnesium. It's inexpensive, it's readily available. I would personally probably just take magnesium citrate. And I think most people would benefit substantially in various ways from taking a dose of roughly 400 milligrams of elemental magnesium per day. If anything, you could take that at the end of the day. There are some reasons to think that could be helpful because if you look, say, at brain magnesium concentrations, they're higher during the sleep period, which seems to at least plausibly affect how responsive you are to certain stimuli that could disrupt sleep. And so then that's based on preclinical research. So whether that translates to humans, I have no idea. I'm not confident in that. But I think a lot of people just forget to take supplements late in the day. And so personally, I, I take magnesium citrate and I just take it with all of the other supplements I take, which is a very limited number of supplements. Right now it's collagen, creatine and magnesium citrate. I take them all at my first meal because I'm going to remember it that way. Other forms of magnesium you could look into if you wanted to. You could take magnesium is glycinate. And again, you'd want a similar dose of elemental magnesium. Some people think that could help reduce gastrointestinal distress. Whether it does, I'm not sure. Some people think it could be better for sleep because glycine seems to have some weak soporific effects. It seems to maybe help a little bit with helping you lose heat from your core, which facilitates sleep onset. And there have been a couple of very small scale studies suggesting that about three grams of glycine can support certain aspects of sleep health, but I think the jury's still out on that one. So you could take magnesium bisglycinate. I think it's a fine form of magnesium to take, but I don't think there's convincing evidence that's any better than citrate yet. It might turn out that way, but I would just take citrate for the time being. And then there is also magnesium 3 and 8, which is interesting. And there have been several studies now looking at taking about one and a half to two grams of magnesium. I think the commercial name of the product might be Magtein, M-A-G-T-E-I-N, or Clarimem, showing that that might help a little bit with cognitive decline. So cognitive dysfunction that occurs during aging. So if you are, say, 60 plus and you're struggling to remember the names of people, you're struggling to remember where you put your keys and so on, then maybe you could take the appropriate dose of magnesium 3 and 8, which it's about. And this is one of those instances where, say, magnesium 3 and 8, then you do from magnesium citrate. That makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Magnesium, uh, definitely one that I focused on a little bit more. I do glycinate. Is that this, would that be this? considered the same as biglycinate. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. I guess the big thing there too is the the form. I would assume is, is oxide just kind of like a, a cheaper, less absorbable one. So just kind of if there was one to look out for, it would be just make sure on the back, it, it you know, it's not oxide. But like you said, oxide could be used if you're like backed up or something like that. And that could be, I guess, something that you could potentially use it for there. Exactly. And there, there are a bunch of other forms of magnesium too. Yeah. Those, are, those are four common used ones. And I would favor citrate, glycinate, or threonate over oxide, unless somebody was trying to use magnesium for its laxative effect. Cool. Awesome. So next one, this this one I feel like been like you just hear a lot about it, ashwagandha. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on this one. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's, it's been used in some parts of the world, particularly places like India for, for thousands of years. And <laughs> they, they've they always thought that it gives you the strength of a horse. It's good for everything under the sun going by Ayurvedic mythology. But in recent times, there's been a flurry of research looking at it. A lot of the research has been done on a particular form of ashwagandha called KSMC. 
66. And disclaimer, I know the people from KSM 66 a little bit because I was the chief science officer at a nutrition company previously where I formulated supplements and we used KSM 66 in one of our products. Whether that makes me biased, I don't know. I don't think I am. I think there are different forms of ashwagandha that are good for different things. And I think time will tell which one is the best, but KSM 66 is the best tested. And we know that it probably is helpful for various different things. So those include maybe most relevant to this audience, sleep and stress. Probably there is the strongest evidence showing that ashwagandha helps with those two things. And there's been a systematic review showing that to be the case. I think it's more likely to help with sleep in people with existing sleep problems and specifically insomnia or insomnia symptoms. And obviously insomnia symptoms are often intimately tied to stress. And so it could be that this reflects the fact that ashwagandha can both reduce subjective stress, so how stressed you feel, but also objective markers of stress too, because obviously how stressed you feel is related to your physiology. And if you look, for instance, at cortisol, then ashwagandha can quite consistently reduce people's plasma cortisol levels and salivary cortisol and so on. So I think if you're feeling a bit worked up at the moment and you're struggling with your sleep, ashwagandha is an interesting option, particularly if some of the other effects that it has are ones that you see. So those include things like boosting testosterone in men. There have been several studies showing that it has this effect. And interestingly, there was a comparison between various different potential testosterone boosters not that long ago, suggesting that ashwagandha was one of the top two candidates. And if you look across studies, I think the average effect is probably something like a 15% boost in testosterone levels when ashwagandha is taken over many weeks, which is, I think, clear clinically meaningful for a lot of people. Maybe related to that, there have been a couple of studies suggesting that taking ashwagandha can improve adaptations to resistance training. And one of the studies used KSM-66, one of them used Sensoril, which is another form of ashwagandha. These forms of ashwagandha differ in various ways. So sometimes they will use different parts of the plant. So one of them might be a, a full spectrum extract using all of the plant. One of them might be a root, one of them might be a leaf. And Sensoril is very concentrated in what a thought to be largely responsible for the effects of ashwagandha, namely the with analytes, whereas KSM 66 is more balanced extract. It's not been designed to be highly concentrated in particular chemicals from the plant. But both of those studies showed that when people take ashwagandha alongside resistance training, they have better improvements in body composition. So they, they both end up with slightly less fat mass, but also slightly more muscle mass, and they gain strength slightly faster and possibly some other adaptations too. And there was a review that looked at all of the different studies of ashwagandha and exercise performance, suggesting that it can not only improve strength and power, but maybe also cardiorespiratory fitness too. So I think for people who are trying to improve their physiques or who are training for sports, maybe if they're a little bit prone to low testosterone levels, let's say they're prone to relative energy deficiency, they just don't consume enough calories and carbohydrates in particular, then I think ashwagandha is a, is a great candidate for that type of person. And I suspect there are a few of those people listening to this right now. I know historically I've been one of those people. Fortunately, nowadays I'm, I'm certainly not. In terms of the different forms of ashwagandha to take, the studies of KSM-66 have typically had people take 300 milligrams twice a day, 600 milligrams in total. Is there an advantage to doing that as opposed to taking 600 milligrams in one dose? I don't know. Never been shown. Personally, I would just take 600 milligrams once because otherwise I might well forget to take it twice. Best time of day? Don't know. If it does reduce cortisol, then it possibly makes sense to take it in the evening. But most studies have used that split dose with a dose in the morning and a dose in the evening. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would take it with food. There are probably some reasons to think that that could help improve the uptake of it. In terms of the different forms, you could take Sensoril. The dose that's used is often around 500 milligrams a day, which frankly is, is quite a lot of some of the active constituents of the plant. There more recently are other forms too, such as Shodan and Nuganda that you could look into. Nuganda has been looked at specifically for its nootropic effects, due to its name. And Shodan is a very, very concentrated extract. So with Shodan, you might only need to take 125 to 250 milligrams, something like that. And there's been some interesting research looking at that and its effects on sleep specifically. So I'll pause there, but, but that's ashwagandha. I think it's a good candidate for a lot of people. The only potential contraindication, probably not the only one, and I realize that I haven't gone into all the details of ashwagandha because it's also been looked at for its effects on many aspects of metabolic health. And it's largely been shown to have positive effects on metabolic health. But the, the one aspect of it that I think is worth flagging is that there have been several case reports suggesting that it might be slightly toxic to the liver in some people. Whether that's 
that's due to something else entirely. So these case reports are confounded by something else or whether the particular supplements that have been used have been contaminated. We don't know, but I think that is interesting. It's just something to, to keep an eye on in the future. So let's say that you were getting regular blood tests and you started taking ashwagandha on a regular basis and your liver enzymes started looking a bit funky. Could there be a link? I don't know. It's plausible based on those few case reports so far. I don't think there's any great reason for concern. I would, however, cycle it. So with the supplements that we've taken so far, I take I take vitamin D seasonally, I take magnesium year round, but I would cycle ashwagandha. And I think something like 12 weeks on and then four to eight weeks off is probably reasonable for a lot of people. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I know that listening to Steve Hall kind of talk about it, he's mentioned too that he would like with ashwagandha, he, that's something that he wouldn't take like for extended periods of time. And I was, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And I guess it's part of it that you just don't have the research on it in terms of like long term, or is it just, just based on maybe it loses its effectiveness or? Yeah, I think, I think part of it is the lack of long term studies. I think it's one of those supplements where the beneficial effects of it accumulate over time. Some supplements you take them and you notice their effects immediately. With ashwagandha, I suspect that the effects largely accrue over time. Interestingly, one of the studies that was done recently looking at Nuganda looked at acute effects on cognition, suggesting there might be some acute effects. But I think the main rationale I have for cycling it is just that it's potent. I think sometimes people think about pharmaceuticals as being really strong and then supplements are somewhat benign. And that's just not true of some supplements. If you look at supplements such as berberine, curcumin, ashwagandha, these, these are powerful substances with respect to human human biology. And so I just think that's worth bearing in mind. It's also worth bearing in mind that many of the different pharmaceuticals that have been developed over time were originally found in nature. Don't assume that just because it comes from a plant, it's not powerful. I think people recognize that more and more, especially because so many people are interested in things like psychedelics now, and they realize that these can be incredibly powerful. But I, I would cycle it because it's quite a, a dirty supplement in that it does seem to affect human biology in many different ways. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's good to know. Still on the subject of ashwagandha, and, uh, you mentioned the testosterone aspect of it. Is that, do you think something that's direct or do you think that, hey, you know, with it helping with stress and, and potentially sleep, that that could be the indirect reason as to why you'll see testosterone. Like for somebody that is highly stressed, it's like, you know, they're, they're in that state of, you know, lower testosterone because of that. And then so they improve their ability to handle stress. And yeah. That's a, that's a good question. And short answer is that I don't know. The slightly longer answer is that my guess is that it's probably a little bit of both. So you, you could look at certain hormones that are upstream of testosterone. You could look at, say, luteinizing hormone, for instance, and you could look at the whole HPT axis and see whether ashwagandha supplementation affects some of those things that are upstream of testosterone. It's also worth mentioning that just because something increases circulating testosterone levels, it doesn't actually mean that it increases signaling through that entire pathway. So sometimes you see that people have very high testosterone levels. They also have very high sex hormone binding globulin levels. And as a result, they actually don't really experience many of the effects of testosterone on their biology. Or it could be that you've been taking exogenous testosterone for a long time and you've had incredibly high levels of testosterone circulating in your bloodstream. But in response to that, various different testosterone receptors have been downregulated. And so you might have loads of testosterone flowing through your body, but it's not being picked up at many sites around the body. Cool. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a good explanation there. So I think we have time for one more here for, for this episode. We'll, we'll have to get you back on for part two of the, the supplement episode. So uh, last one I want to go over today, and I feel like you're a great person to talk about this because, you know, I know sleep is, is definitely one of your wheelhouses, melatonin. I'm curious to hear about melatonin and, you know, if you think there's any benefit to it and whatnot. With it's it. actually a, it's a big subject. <laughs> yeah, where to start with melatonin. So melatonin is a, it's a hormone that's produced by the pineal gland in the brain, primarily during the so-called biological nighttime. And it signals to cells throughout your body by way of two receptors that it's the biological nighttime and therefore to engage in appropriate activities for that time of day. And so people sometimes think of it as being a sleep supplement, but really it's an internal time cue. It's an internal signal of darkness outside. And I think that's helpful to know because it relates to how it's best to use melatonin. On that subject, the strongest research indicating melatonin, in my opinion, is related to shifting the timing of somebody's body clock. And so if 
you're experiencing jet lag, if you're experiencing shift work and sleep disturbances related to trying to sleep at times of day that are out of time with your body clock. If you have certain types of circadian rhythm, sleep, wake problems, if you have a disorder such as delayed sleep phase syndrome, then melatonin can be really helpful with all these different instances. And I think maybe the most stark of those is, is what's called non-24 hour sleep wake rhythm disorder in which somebody, and typically this occurs because they have dysfunctional retinal photoreceptors, meaning that there are these cells, specialized cells in the eyes called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that should detect light and then feed that information back to the master clock in the brain that then relays that information back to the pineal gland that produces melatonin at the appropriate time of day and then keeps your body clock in time with the world around you. In these people, those photoreceptors in the eyes don't work well. So this affects many people out there who are blind. And what it means is that their body's clock doesn't keep time with the 24 hour day. And so occasionally they're in time with the day, but then the rest of the time they're just drifting through the 24 hour day. So for most people, because their body's clocks aren't precisely 24 hours, but are slightly longer than 24 hours, what that means is that from day to day, their clocks are shifting slightly later. And so it's only every few weeks that they end up back in time with the day again. And then the rest of the time, it's like they have varying degrees of jet lag. So in those people, taking melatonin can be completely transformative because now all of a sudden they're able to use it to anchor the timing of their body's clock, keep them on time with the world around them and feel human as a result of that. Something like delayed sleep phase syndrome where somebody's sleep-wake cycle is very late relative to other people. So you sometimes see this in teenagers, for instance, who have strong sensitivity to the phase delaying effects of light at night. Melatonin can be really helpful because if you take it, say, five hours before your bedtime, if you normally fall asleep at 2 a.m. and wake up at 10 a.m., but you have to be up at six in the morning for work, that's going to suck. So you want to shift your sleep earlier. Melatonin can help drag your body's clock earlier. And then if you're using it for, say, jet lag, there are websites such as Jet Lag Rooster, which I think is now under the umbrella of Sleepopolis, where you can go and you can plug in the details of your flight. And if taking melatonin is helpful, given the nature of the travel, it will give you recommendations about when to take melatonin. Jet Lag Rooster does the job. So outside of those instances where you're using melatonin to shift the time <coughs> and just related to that, if you were using it for that express purpose, the optimal dose is probably right around one milligram, somewhere around there. You don't want to take much more than that because what can happen is that melatonin ends up in your system longer and then it spills over to the wrong part of what's called a phase response curve. So that whereas if you take in a small dose, it's pulling your clock in the right direction. Now, initially it's pulling your clock in the right direction, but because it's in your bloodstream for longer, eventually it's also pushing your clock in the wrong direction, if that makes sense. So dose for that is around one milligram. Other instances of melatonin use though include things like people who are just using it for run-of-the-mill sleep disorders. And melatonin, it does help a little bit with sleep for a lot of people. The effect sizes aren't huge, but on average across studies, people who have insomnia and people who have subclinical sleep complaints, melatonin will cause you to fall asleep slightly faster. It will probably slightly improve your sleep efficiency. So the proportion of time that you're in bed, that you're actually asleep, maybe improve your subjective sleep quality a little bit, maybe extend your sleep a tiny bit too. Different forms of melatonin might types of sleep issues. So the half-life of conventional melatonin is quite short, metabolized very quickly. And that can be really helpful when it comes to shifting your body's clock around. But if say you have sleep maintenance issues, let's say that you're 50 years old and you're finding that you wake up frequently throughout the night and you want something to help you sleep throughout the night, taking time release melatonin might be a better option for you. And there's a particular form of it that's used clinically called circadian. It's used at a dose of two milligrams that can help with sleep maintenance insomnia. Some people are also using combined time release melatonin and conventional faster release melatonin too. And there are some reasons to think that that might actually be preferable in certain instances. One of the interesting things about melatonin is that it doesn't seem to cause tolerance the way that many drugs do and the way that many hormones do. If you took testosterone, Jeff, because all of a sudden you wanted to turn into an IFBB pro, what you would find is that quite quickly, your body's own testosterone synthesis would start to decline in response to that. There's a negative feedback loop. Melatonin doesn't seem to be like that. And I often hear influencers say, you shouldn't take melatonin for long periods of time because then you're going to shut down your body's own production of it. There's no evidence showing that, which is weird and it's interesting. So I actually think it's probably relatively safe for most people to take in the long term. And also some people are concerned that it could impair reproduction 
production. And theoretically, that makes sense. And certainly, melatonin is really important to seasonal changes in reproduction in some animals such as sheep, for instance. But in humans, there's not really convincing evidence that melatonin strongly affects reproduction or development in kids either, for that instance. There have been a few quite long-term studies of melatonin supplementation by young people. So I'm not recommending it for those people. I'm just saying that the safety profile is, is actually impressively good. And I don't think that people should be too concerned about it. However, with all of that said, I think that when people want to improve their sleep, they should be doing other things first. And it's actually rare that I recommend melatonin. I, I recommend it for those instances where someone's having a really hard time aligning their body's clock with the time that they want it aligned with. But in other instances, I think if someone was looking to improve their sleep, they should probably start by focusing on some of the other things that we've probably spoken about previously, such as stimulus control, certain aspects of sleep hygiene, and so on, having an appropriate pre-bed relaxation routine. I'll, I'll finish by saying that there are also some interesting use cases that people are starting to study now. And I do think that melatonin could prove helpful for various different clinical conditions over time. So for example, there's some interesting research looking at people who have diabetes. These people often have circadian melatonin rhythms that are quite different from healthy others. They also sometimes synthesize less melatonin than other people, going at least by presence of the major melatonin metabolite, 6 of toxic melatonin in the urine. And their biological rhythms in general have various different characteristics that differ from those of healthy other people. And so if you can use melatonin as a so-called chronobiotic to align those rhythms appropriately, then maybe there are some benefits to be had there. There are also some direct effects of melatonin on various different tissues in the body. So for example, it seems to help with beta cell regeneration, which is very relevant to diabetes. And for this reason, I think well-time use of melatonin could help with things like prediabetes, diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, certain other clinical conditions too. Some people are also very interested in melatonin for its potential anti-aging effects. And I think there are some good reasons to think that it could be helpful in those instances where people are trying to defy the aging clock because it does target many of the so-called hallmarks of aging. And then otherwise, people are also looking at the things like COVID-19 and whether it's helpful in that instance, it's hard to tell. But just related to that, I, I do think one instance in which it can be very helpful is in, say, ICU or in a hospital setting. So if I, God forbid, ended up in hospital tomorrow, I'm in the UK, so I can't even access melatonin regardless of whether I want it. <laughs> but if I had some and I was trying to sleep in that hospital setting where the lights are always on and that light at night is thereby suppressing my body's own melatonin synthesis, then I might well take melatonin to help keep my biological rhythms in check and to help me sleep at night. And I'd certainly be using an eye mask and earplugs in that circumstance that isn't conducive to sleeping well. So it just gives you an idea of how, as usual, it depends. It definitely has its time and its place. And I think a lot of people will just use it somewhat willy-nilly when they shouldn't. They should be attending to other things first. But with that said, if the source of melatonin that you use is a good source, contains what you think it does, then it's probably perfectly safe. I wouldn't take it year round, but it probably is perfectly safe. And it could also be that we eventually find out that taking it year round is actually fine. That, that frankly wouldn't surprise me. And I know some people that do that, but I just think that when possible, we should be trying to remove crutches in our lives. And some people end up using things like sleep medications and nutraceuticals as kinds of crutches. And I just think, frankly, that's probably unhealthy. Yeah. So the, the big thing too, that, that I commonly hear with it was kind of like you said it, like, like, oh, it's going to lower your, your reduction of it naturally. And, and like you said, that's just kind of a, a myth. And so that's obviously not going to be the, the case there with that. I actually do use melatonin regularly for me. And, and so it sounds like kind of what you said there on that was like, it's not necessarily, you wouldn't recommend doing that year round, but it sounds like if for somebody that potentially could like, you know, it helps them maybe fall asleep and they still get good sleep. Like you feel like you get good sleep. It helps you sleep overall. Maybe it is a placebo effect. I don't know. Would would that change your mind on it? Or would you still be like, hey, I probably would would lay off of it from, from time to time? Yeah, I, I probably encourage people to taper off it yeah. taper off it slowly w with anything that affects sleep i think it makes sense to well with nearly anything that affects sleep i think it makes sense to taper off it gradually certainly with frank sleep drugs so z drugs things like that it's really important to have a slow taper because you will get with withdrawal effects from them there isn't really good evidence of that happening with melatonin so i think you probably don't need to be too concerned about that but i'd probably taper off it and if anything you'll just be saving a few bucks bucks now yeah. and then but with that said i, I do want to just add a couple of details 
themselves in there too. So Jeff, if you're using it regularly, there are some interesting interactions that people should consider. There are some other interesting ones that people probably shouldn't worry about. One of them is when you eat relative to taking melatonin. So we know, for instance, that melatonin acutely reduces glucose stimulated insulin secretion. So if you take somebody and you, you give them lunch at 1 p.m. and an hour before that, you give them a, a bolus of three milligrams of melatonin, their blood sugar will swing much more in response to that meal because the pancreas won't produce as much insulin as it did previously. And so what that means is that if you take melatonin before sleep, let's say that you take it an hour before sleep. If you're used to eating very late, let's say that you finish your final meal half an hour before that, so an hour and a half before bed, melatonin could be negatively affecting your postprandial response to that final meal. So I do think that it's important for people to finish consuming anything that contains calories, probably at least two hours in advance of taking melatonin. So maybe just be extra particular about that. There's also an interaction here between genotype and melatonin use and food intake, because one of the genes that encodes one of the melatonin receptors called MTNR1B comes in a few different varieties. One of these is quite common. It is present in about a third of the general population. And people who have this particular genetic variant that encodes this melatonin 2 receptor have an exaggerated blood sugar response to the effects of melatonin on meals. That makes sense. And so it could be that people with that particular receptor variant need to be more particular about finishing their final meal well in advance of taking melatonin. And interestingly, people with that melatonin receptor variant are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, and some other related health conditions too. And my guess is that that's just because without realizing it, they've, they've had these exaggerated responses to final meals. And maybe it's also because melatonin synthesis can occur in the morning too shortly after you wake up. And if you still got melatonin in your blood and you consume breakfast shortly after waking, then that could also also affect your body's response to that first meal too. So it could be that we find out that eventually people who have that melatonin receptor variant and some other melatonin receptor gene variants too should slightly modify their eating window. And plausibly, it makes sense that they benefit from a slightly shorter eating window. So I realized that was long-winded, but basically make sure that you finish eating well before you take your melatonin in the evening. That's good to know. I have no idea about that at all. So yeah, really, yeah, really helpful there and definitely, you know, make sure that, that I'm not eating before it. And I think that lines up pretty, I would say that lines up pretty well with like, you know, the corona nutrition that we that we've talked about in the past too you know you don't you don't want to eat you know too close to bed things like that so cool greg well we, we got through about half of them i was wondering if how, how many we would get through i'd love to have you back on again to have part two of this uh, supplement episode but before i let you go for this episode is there anywhere uh where you'd like to lead the audience to or anything like that yeah sure social media at greg potter phd anyone wants to get in touch but yeah we'll leave it there i, I think half is probably generous i think we probably got to about a quarter or a third. yeah <laughs> that's often the case with me unfortunately jeff <laughs> I love it. Ton of information. I'd rather it be that way than just be like melatonin and then, okay, on to the next one. So, and then hopefully next time we have you on too, we can hear about your little teaser that you had at the beginning of the episode as well too. So awesome. Great. As always, ton of great information in here and we will chat with you soon. 